Okay, so this um, video uh, is about uh, human nature. Uh, we're in the human nature section of the course, and we're going to talk about Plato. So Plato is uh, one of the most important prominent philosophers to have ever lived. Uh, some would say that uh, he is the most important philosopher. Um, Alfred Whitehead, who was a famous philosopher in the 20th century, said uh, everything is a footnote to Plato in the sense that the core ideas, uh, the core debates, the big questions uh, all come back to Plato. So Plato is uh, a giant uh, in the philosophical field, and so his thoughts on human nature are certainly important to address. And there's two readings. Um, they are both from uh, the Republic. Uh, one is a, a very famous story from the Republic, uh, probably the most famous story, uh, philosophic story ever written. And the other one is a reading, a summary of kind of the core uh, elements of the Republic as related to human nature. Okay, so in Plato's cave, uh, so essentially what you have uh, is, this is a metaphor, so it is a story or an allegory. Um, it's a story that says one thing literally, but means something else at a deeper level. So in the cave, uh, humanity is portrayed as occupying a state of bondage from childhood. So you see these uh, people the prisoners, that from the moment they are born are put into chains and they know no differently. Uh, their necks are fastened so they can only look forward, they cannot see what's behind them. Uh, but again, they don't know they're enslaved, they don't know that they're prisoners. And, you know, looking at it metaphorically, what Plato is saying is that we don't know that we're prisoners. Most of us in our society are chained uh, into a certain way of thinking, uh, into certain delusions. And so you can ask yourself, what is it that is, constitutes your chains? Okay, and so what are we bound to? Well, essentially the prisoners are, are focused on what's right ahead of them. Uh, that's all they can see. And what they see are shadows uh, that are projected from a fire and images that are uh, residing behind them. But of course, they don't know that what they're looking at is shadows. They think that what they're looking at is real. And so these shadows will pass by, and the, uh, the people behind them that are controlling the shadows will make sounds. And so they think that these sounds come from the shadows. Again, they don't know any better, because they cannot see anything differently. And so they're not aware of the real source from, what, uh, from where reality springs. They think that what they see is real, where again it is secondhand, it is false, it is a shadow. It is just appearance. Um, and so, again, it's natural to believe that this is the real world because, again, that's all they can see. Then the story moves on to the release from bondage. So there is a person who releases one of the prisoners. And this release is described as something very painful. It's described as a very long process, a torturous process. The prisoner doesn't want to leave because they don't want to leave what they know. They don't want to leave what they assume to be true. You know, think about your own life, how difficult it is to let go of illusions, or to get lo to let go of biases, uh, to let go of preconceptions, things that we are used to, because but we don't want to question, because questioning is harder. Letting go of some of our cherished beliefs, our cherished ways of thinking about things, the way we've been taught, can be extraordinarily difficult. Um, and so what happens is that essentially the prisoner has to be forced out, has to be pulled out. So if we think about this in terms of education, we think about this in terms of human nature, to get to a higher level of truth uh, is for Plato, or at least it can be, a very difficult, painful, forced process, something that's done almost against your will. If we think about this in terms of education, and this story uh, is very famous in educational circles, you know, what it means is you've got to uh, coerce people to let go of uh, the beliefs that are harming them and keeping them back. And so each stage, so they go, you know, first the prisoner looks back and, and is dazzled by the fire. It's bright. He, he, you know, thinks it must be an illusion. It must be less real uh, because he can't make it out. But eventually his eyes get used to it and he moves up. Uh, then they move up closer to the uh, opening of the cave. And again, there's this sense of being dazzled by the sun. They get out of the cave. They can't see anything. They can't look directly at the sun because it is, again, so bright and brilliant. And eventually you look at the things reflected by the sun and then you can look at the objects, and eventually the sun itself. And so what um, Plato is saying is that this process of getting to the truth, of understanding what is real, 
is not easy. It's not quick. It's not automatic. It's not something that happens in a flash and you're there. Attaining the truth uh, is something that takes a lifetime. Okay, now, when the, the prisoner is eventually at the highest plane and the highest truth, there is no desire by the prisoner, who is now the free man, to return to the cave. They wouldn't want to do it, because they are in truth. Why would you want to go back to the shadows? Uh, the, for the prisoner, the former prisoner, wouldn't value the kind of the prizes and the prestige uh, of the lower level. You know, people on the lower level are saying, you're great, you're wonderful, uh, you know the shadows, you're the best at, uh, you know, understanding this reality. But for somebody who's in truth, what they value in that lower level isn't very important, it isn't attractive. But the, the, this free person nevertheless goes back, you know, perhaps uh, out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of, you know, freeing others, perhaps out of a sense of compassion. And so eventually, they get back inside the, the, the cave, and it's dark, and the, the freed prisoner can't see anything. So those that remain, those that have never left their chains, make fun of them. They think they're delusional. They think they're crazy. And so again, this is a metaphor of someone who has achieved wisdom coming back to tell the people that in our world, that what we value isn't really important. We're going to think they're crazy, they're delusional, they're just some kind of kook. Because of course, what we value and what we find important must be important. And eventually, you know, there is the sense of the, the prisoners turning, not only mocking, but threatening, and even um, the potential to use violence. And so, what this says is that we as human beings are not the kind of creatures that are naturally going to recognize our error and naturally uh, accept that someone may have achieved a greater knowledge than us. We're people that cling to our opinions and our biases and our beliefs, and we're ready to be confrontational, to reject and even to harm those that put or, or cherished our usual beliefs into question. You know, just think, for instance, of the process of segregation and how hard it was for some people to let go of this notion that the, what they had believed was, was wrong, it was an error. Um, okay, and most people don't make it out of the cave. You know, that's the other kind of point of Plato. So you see this, this image of human nature, that we're trapped, we're prisoners, uh, some of us are let go or freed, but the freeing process is very difficult and very time-consuming. Now I want to get to the, the reading that uh, I created that is essentially a summary of the Republic's broader view of human nature. And the question becomes, you know, can we get out of the cave? Um, or are the, the general mass of humanity necessarily stuck in the cave? You know, need it be the case that most human beings are going to be prisoners of the shadow and appearances and opinions uh, and false values? And the Plato as a whole uh, is, in one sense, a um, dwelling, a meditation on that question. Okay, so when Plato addresses this question, can we ever get out in broader terms? Can we create a society uh, where people are free. His answer is that the only solution is that philosophers are put in charge. So, uh, if you want a freed society, a society where people attain truth and um, are no longer bound to the shadows, you need philosophers in charge. And of course, many people would mock this. And Plato says, yeah, of course they mock it because they think philosophers are just crazy people with their heads in the clouds. Because again, what the general person and the general society values is not what the philosopher values. Now, in discussing the possibility of philosophers being in control or what they would do if they were ever put in control, he talks about this notion of thinking about the individual in terms of a tripartite soul. And he compares society to an individual. And so the tripartite soul means that we're made up of three parts. And he defines these parts as appetite, spirit, and reason. So the appetite is the desires that we have within us. The appetite is our urges, our inclinations, um, our physical longings. Spirit is, you might think of, kind of your character, and especially when it comes to strength, uh, discipline, commitment. Reason is our ability to think. You know, reason is our ability to understand, not only to kind of calculate and to determine what is best in the situation, but to wisdom. Um, the ability to understand what is ultimately important, what is most valuable. 
And so we have these three parts within us. And Plato says we all have these parts within us. And he says the problem is when the parts are not arranged properly. When the parts are not arranged properly, where what is supposed to be in control is not in control, then we run into problems. We are in a sense miserable. But when the parts are arranged properly, we are happy, we are satisfied, we are fulfilled. And so he talks about this as an individual, but if we apply to society as a whole, when society is not ordered properly, when it is not governed by those that ought to govern, then you're going to have a society that is ultimately not only um, based on inequity, but is, but is sad, is chaotic, is longing. Uh, people are not happy. Whereas society that is ordered properly uh, would be one that uh, is happy and functions properly and functions well. And so, you know, the example that I give in this paper is that you think about an alcoholic. An alcoholic is someone who is driven by his or her desires. And this desire to consume, this desire to take the drink, uh, ultimately destroys the individual. They lose friends, they lose families, they're not able to be in control of their own life. They're not uh, able to think properly or clearly. And there are people that are not generally happy because uh, they know that their happiness is dependent upon this temporary feeling that comes and goes. Uh, and it only comes with this alcohol, which then uh, leaves them further behind, um, and further dependent. So the person that's alcohol, the alcoholic, is driven by desires. And we could say the same thing about someone who's a drug addict or someone who's a materialist or someone who uh, wants above all else to be recognized and loved um, by others or praised by others. You know, in any case, in all these examples, you're driven by desire. And when desire comes to be in control, spirit oftentimes be, is corrupted as well. Our character is weakened. We cannot resist what our reason knows to be wrong. Um, even though we know that we should be living a different life. And most alcoholics, most drug addicts, most people addicted understand that they're not living the life that they ought to be living. They can't help it. Because, again, their character has been corrupted. Their character is now guided by, um, by the desire. You know, think about uh, society as a well. whole. Um, you know, example I, I give in the text is think about when cities win championships. Oftentimes, people go crazy. They're unable to control their impulses. They break things. They destroy things. It's chaos. You've got a society that is not led by reason. Society not led by reason would be one um, which may desire gossip, which may desire to know everything about everyone, all the kind of the dirty details, instead of one that is devoted to character development. Society guided by desire might be one that values sports as the most important thing in the world. Um, one that might be in debt because they are constantly trying to uh, fulfill their desires. Okay, so the questions, um, another question become, can, can anyone potentially govern themselves like the philosopher? Is it in the capacity of any individual to be like the philosopher and to be ordered properly where reason is controlled, is in control, spirit follows reason, supports reasons, and desire is then uh, modified and directed to proper channels, healthy channels. And for Plato, the answer is essentially no. He ascribes, he adopts a form of spiritual essentialism, which means that some people simply have different balances of character and their character is not going to be as strong in one area as it is in another. And he says most of us are driven by desires. Most of us... Um, the appetitive, the desirous part of our character, is the strongest. However, um, you know, and you might say, well, this is all all's lost. Because, well, if most people are driven by desire, then, you know, most people are going to be miserable. Most people are going to be addicts of one sort or another. Most people are going to be chaotic and not able to control their life and run into debt and things like that. But he says, no. If philosophers were in control, what you would have are people in charge that are able to design society properly. They're able to create fair and equitable laws and rules. And they would have the support of the guardians. And those would be represented as strong in spirit. You know, think of those that are willing to defend the country, die for the country, those in the soldiers, uh, the police departments, those that um, 
uh, you know, are always willing to do rights, are willing to sacrifice for, for the best. These people would follow the philosophers. These people would support the philosophers. They would enforce the rules and the way uh, the society the philosophers envision. And in this case, then, people that are strongest in desires, they would be directed toward healthy, uh, fulfilling, um, productive ends. You know, so for example, um, you know, think of entertainment. Instead of uh, directing your energies towards like, gluttony or the biggest show in the world, uh, you might be directed towards um, art that uplifts. You might be directed towards uh, being a great chef instead of just making junk. Instead of you know watching porn, you might um, be directed to to paint or to make to beauty um, to help other people with their appearances, you know, something like that. And so one of the things that, that Plato recommends, uh, and this would be highly controversial, is he'd say you got to censor. Uh, in his day, it was poetry that was the popular form of entertainment. But if we apply it to contemporary society, Plato would say we'd have to censor, modify our entertainment. Instead of television shows or internet content that glorifies the indulgent life, that glorifies the excessive life, that glorifies you know, people going out of control, you know, think real world or reality television in general, he would design entertainment that points us towards something higher, something better, something that is going to promote the idea that you know, reason and control and, and ordering our soul is the proper function and listening to rational laws is what we ought to do. And he says, in this world, that is the potential to refashion society. And so that everyone, even those that are stronger in desire and appetites and those that are stronger in spirit, will find fulfillment. And society will be ordered. It won't be a society that is indulgent, that is constantly in, in huge debt because they, the citizens want more and more and more and more. Um, and so that's the hope. You know, so for human nature... Uh, to exist in a way that is most profitable for everyone. And in a certain sense, Plato's saying, you got to know your role. you got to know what you're strongest at. And those that are strongest in reason, those that are philosophers, ought to be in charge. And if this happens, then we can create a society in which people of all human natures, not simply those that are philosophers, flourish and uh, are fulfilled.